a welcome to our first session on hidden histories. Uh, tonight we're looking at the thematic of gender in dress and graphic design. And it's a great pleasure to sort of build upon our previous conversations around uh, sort of historiographies and methodologies, looking at the typologies of interiors, thinking about pedagogic strategies. Uh, next week, we'll be thinking about the collaborative nature of gender and design creativity, and indeed the way in which scholarship has, has or hasn't explored that. But tonight, we thought the juxtaposition of the fashioning of the body and the fashioning of consumption and representation through graphic design had particular synergies. So it's my great pleasure to hand over um, to my uh, co-conspirator, Alex Bannister, um, who is one of our DHS representatives and ambassador, um, who is co-convening our, our seminar series, and she'll be introducing all of our wonderful speakers tonight. So over to Alex. Thank you, Claire, for your introduction. Um, I hope you're all looking forward to tonight's papers on gender in dress and graphic design. Um, as with our other events, uh, each presentation is about 10 minutes, followed by a group Q&A session shared by Claire. So if you have any thoughts or questions or comments, then please do use the chat box throughout the evening, and these will be answered in due course after all papers have been given. Um, and please do also check out the Design History Society's blog, where you can find some interviews with some of the speakers tonight and from the series as a whole as well. Uh, so without further ado, I'll introduce our first speaker, um, who is Anna Dempsey, who teaches design history at the University of Massachusetts, Dartmouth. Anna teaches history of design, gender and popular culture, interior and architectural history, and works to transform the conventional survey of art history to reflect a more global and intersectional perspective. And tonight, Anna will be sharing with us her research into the histories of Native American modern designers. So I will hand over to you, Anna. I think you're on mute, Anna. Okay, now I'll begin now. Excuse me, I should know this by now, but I'd like to thank Claire, Alex, and the seminar organizers, and all of you are, who are here today. First, I'd like to acknowledge that I'm speaking to you from the traditional homeland of the Wampanoag in what is now Southeastern Massachusetts. And so to begin, first slide, please. Thank you. Angel Decora or Hanuk Mahiwi Kilinaka, an early 20th century indigenous artist was removed from her Nebraska home to attend Virginia's Hampton Institute, an educational center whose mission was to assimilate indigenous people into the dominant white settler culture. Despite this early trauma, she ultimately thrived as an artist, designer, and teacher. After Hampton, Decor studied illustration with Howard Pyle and painting at Smith College in Massachusetts. Although she worked as a professional illustrator, she felt constrained by the colonialist belief that authentic Indian culture eschewed technology, adaptation of other cultural forms and industrialization. Howard Pyle, for example, encouraged Decora to adhere to the conventional, generalized depictions of Native Americans that periodical readers expected. Advice she followed to some extent, notably as you see in the photo of the Indian princess in long braids and traditional dress. Eventually, she grew frustrated with this compromise. Decora left illustration when she was given the opportunity to teach, quote, Indian art, specifically design at the Carlisle Indian School, the US government's premier boarding institution for Native Americans. Yet, as Decora noted, quote, when I first introduced the subject, Indian art, to the Carlisle Indian students, I experienced a discouraging sensation that I was addressing members of an alien race, end quote. Yet she did achieve a measure of pedagogical and professional success. Decora's extensive education, illustration career, and friendships with successful women artists, such as Cecilia Bow and Alice Barber Stevens, positioned her, as Anne Ruggles Gare posits, at the intersection of several movements within American art. In her creative work and teaching at Carlisle, Decora could challenge the dominant representation of Indians as exotic as a vanishing people associated with a primeval America. Specifically, the arts and craft, craft movements, integration of fine arts design and non-Western traditions opened 
the door for First Nation artists to embark on a professional career and for indigenous art to be regarded as a distinctive component of national visual culture. To Decorah, Native American design and art was entangled with and embedded in the landscape. She writes, quote, as all peoples have treasured the history of their wanderings in some form, so has the American Indian had his pictograph and symbolic records evolve into a system of design which reflects the whole breadth of his native land. For Decora, graphic forms, the focus of this talk, allowed her to communicate the richness, complexity, and evolving nature of indigenous material traditions. She sought to move away from the colonialist view that regarded authentic Indian culture as static, fixed in space, place, and time. In her work, she integrated indigenous with white Euro aesthetics. Decorah's letter forms are legible as English and as indigenous text. In this regard, her art functioned as a subtle form of resistance, as an example of the survivance of Native American traditions. According to Ashinabi critic and historian Gerald Weisner, quote, survivance is more than survival. Survivance means redefining ourselves. It means raising our social and political consciousness. It means holding on to ancient principles while eagerly embracing change. It means doing what is necessary to keep our cultures alive, end quote. And this is what Decorah did with her graphic contributions to ethnomusicologist Natalie Curtis's The Indian's Book, what you see here. Decorah's design work from the book cover to typography to graphics represented the distinctive cultural identities of the nation's many Indian tribes. Her letter forms materialized indigenous ties to memory and to the natural world. She states, quote, the Indian woman sits in the open, drawing inspiration from the broad aspects of nature, end quote. For the frontispiece, what you see on the left, she incorporated the eagle, a significant symbol for many native tribes. From the eagle's yellow beak at the top of the page, we see a song emerge and flow down the margins, a clarion call to all indigenous peoples to acknowledge their connections. By contrast, the typography on the title page that introduces each tribe materializes the plants, animals, and inanimate forms that populate and distinguish the landscapes each nation inhabits. So text, like all works of art, visually encodes how we see and how we are embodied within the world. According to Jaworski and Thurlow, letter forms are part of a quote, semiotic landscape through which discourses, communities, and identities are mediated and reproduced. That is not only the non-human world, but human bodies within the world, end quote. And this is the framework for how we can understand Decor's letter forms for the Indian's book. Next slide, please. On the title page for the Winnebago, Decorah framed the text with an illustration of the glass seed beadwork and braiding we see on the beaded object below on the left. In the weighted text, as in the stepped letter K, we feel the beads weighed on the paper and thus the body. Beads and bodies are in turn entangled with the natural landscape. For example, the jagged florid-like components of the two E's, W and G, materialize the memory of the fertile upper middle Midwest landscape or lake country from which the Winnebago had been forcibly removed by the US government. Decorah's Wabanaki letter forms also evoke the natural world. The leafy forms point to the Penobscot Wabanaki's main habitat, while the braided framing references the beads found on many typical Wabanaki pouches that you, such as what you see on the lower right. These pouches, which contained medicinal plants, were kept close to the body. By the 19th century, like many other Native American tribes, the Wabanaki used the standardized glass beads manufactured by Europeans. But the abstracted, naturalized designs continued to inform their work, which they sold to Euro American tourists to support themselves. Such work represents an example of adaptation and survivance. Next slide, please. On the Kiowa title page, what well, you see on the upper left, Decorah's K and N incorporate the pointed shape seen in the child's cradle board wooden frame, a, conven a conventional Plains Indians object. 
So the illustration on the text title page was likely by Decora. It also includes the symbol of the eagle we see on the cradle board. But I wish to pause here to highlight the work of Silverhorn, the image you see on the lower left. Silverhorn is a Kiowa Indian who also negotiated European and, nat and native cultures. This painting on Hyde, a representation of a ritual landscape, is the only known depiction of sacred beings from Kiowa religion and myth, but without the sacred effigy associated with the sun dance. Silverhorn memorializes Kiowa cosmology, but keeps the secret rituals hidden from the Western gaze. Like Decorah, he highlights the eagle, who as Natalie Curtis notices in her introduction is, quote, loved and revered by the Indians. The eagle soars aloft, and he may look upon the sun, the giver of life, the celestial emblem of divine forces, end quote. And like Decorah's letter forms, this painting is an iconic example of Indian survivance. So I'd like to conclude with Angel Decor's designs for the Kwak Util title page. The illustration below the text, which represents a combination of a grizzly bear and orca, is composed with the ovoids, S forms, and U forms that characterize the Northwest Coast Indian form line design, also evident in the objects you see in the slide. The letter forms calligraphic shapes, which vary in width, wind in and through space. In the illustration above the text, fluid lines connect multiple sets of eyes above and below the nose. According to art historian Aldona Genitis, quote, an important characteristic of Northwest Coast art is known as split representation, which is a manner of depicting forms, animals, ancestors, etc., cetera, as split in two and joined at the nose and the mouth, thus allowing for three viewpoints of a figure simultaneously, end quote. That is, the Kwak Util were long exploring multispatial perspectives prior to the avant-garde experiments of Picasso and other Euro-American artists, compelling us to question what modernism really means. In her letter forms, Decorah also experiments with and interprets Kwak Util aesthetics. We see totem masks in the letters and stylized references to a grizzly bear, and other animals in the letters K, W, A, and T. The T, in fact, appears as an imagined fantastic creature with almost no reference to the English T. Together, these stylized forms materialize the interconnection between the individual and the community, between the past and the present, and most importantly, between the human and natural worlds. In sum, Angel Decor's graphic designs represent the survivance of indigenous traditions, traditions which have adapted to and subtly subverted white settler culture. They function, as Gerald Weisner aptly notes, as, quote, a mirror dance in the contact zone, end quote. Thank you. Thanks so much for starting us off, Anna, and such fantastic uh, images in your presentation as well. Um, next up, we have uh, Dr. Jaylene Grove, who is Assistant Professor in Illustration at the Rhode Island School of Design. And today she'll be sharing with us the work of the British illustrator Olive Allen in girls' periodicals of the Edwardian era. So I will hand over to you now. All right, thank you very much. Um, first slide. Thank you. So thank you for having me. My talk today is actually summarizing a forthcoming book chapter coming out with Manchester University Press on the topic of 19th century women illustrators. So in her 1975 essay, The Laugh of the Medusa, the feminist theorist Hélène Sissou argued that women writing about women, particularly the pleasures of the body and pre-adolescent sensuality, was in itself a revolutionary act because it encouraged women to take a non-patriarchal pleasures and desires seriously. In the era, <clears throat> excuse me, when the printed image reigned supreme, what illustration buffs call the golden age of illustration, which is roughly 1880 to 1920, women designing and illustrating for women was even more powerful. And I'm saying this because images communicate far faster than words and with more memorability and influence. Of the thousands of women graphic arts workers at the period, only a few are remembered today. I have long been interested in who is not famous, who had the mundane career that will give insight into how it was for the majority of artists, not the exceptional stars. And Olive Allen is just such a person. 
and I've studied her life uh, from her estate and speaking to her daughter. Olive Allen was born in 1879 and raised in Cornwall. Her father was a lenient Methodist clergyman and theirs was a very fun loving family who put on amateur farces, doggerel writing contests and games. And this gave Allen her start as a humorist. Her mother was the breadwinner of the family, directing their spacious home, in their spacious home, a progressive high end boarding school for girls aged six to 18, where they trained for university entrance and studied topics such as algebra and chemistry. Olive was the youngest, and she was raised among these school girls and also her elder sisters, who were also teachers there. So it's a very girl-centric universe. And I'm using the word girl in the sense it was used in at the time to refer to teens and young unwed women. Olive was lively. Her nickname at home was in fact, Bad Anna for her mischievousness. In 1898, she began formal arts and crafts training in Liverpool, and this was followed by two years at the Slade, and she graduated in 1902. The 1890s was a time of expanded women's rights, women's participation in the arts and crafts movement, and it was the emergence of magazines aimed at girls that negotiated issues of modernity and gender. It's also the decade in which women's humor made a comeback in the works of the so-called new woman writers, Presidents such as Jane Austen were seen as having been suppressed through the Victorian period. So this is a reclaiming of women's voice. While a student, Olive Allen spoofed a magazine, that's what you see on the screen here, the cover in one spread, for the purposes of satirizing her arts and crafts education, as well as her favorite instructor, J. Herbert McNair, and her and the other girl students over the top cultish fondness for him. And I'll just read the caption for the illustration on the far right there. You see two men, one of which is holding a key in his hand aloft. Sir Thingamajig says, by the rue, that is no small thing in latch keys that thou carriest. And the other man says, his name is Sir, what do you call? By the mass, methinks thou art right. Twas designed by one J. Herbert McNair. So this uselessly giant key mocks the arts and crafts doctrine of functionality and slyly lampoons a masculine artistic ego insofar as keys are phallic. As a well-known symbol of the new woman's freedoms, the latch key also points to a battle for control over female emancipation and competition in professional spheres. Women found the keys they were given, however, rarely measured up in men's eyes, for they were rarely given the chance to make the no small thing. May I please have the next slide? The magazine Girls Realm was one of Olive Allen's first clients. It stands out for its mixture of the traditionally feminine, sewing and fashion, for example, alongside articles on the best schools and non-traditional careers. In its initial years under a female editor, Girls Realm was also lavishly illustrated by women and not just advanced ones. Many of the illustrations and cartoons are by emerging artists like Olive Allen, and sometimes by readers themselves. They frequently had competitions and sometimes published over the transom submissions. Allen's cartoons, like her book illustrations, which also began at this time, were of children and are decidedly cute in both draftsmanship and gag. Cuteness like cartoon and caricature, which Allen also practiced, is often more than meets the eye. Its rhetoric of innocence is disarming, easy to dismiss, and this makes it a handy weapon for the subaltern who cannot speak with directness or in the elite visual dialects. Women cartoonists like Olive Allen used cuteness, mock innocence, humor, and what she herself called fooling about to cloak seriousness and to allow gently provocative ideas to exist. For example, a sweet toddler encounters the kindly minister coming to visit on the left, do you keep bees, he asks. No, but we keep flies, she innocently replies. The specimen jar clues us in what she means. So what's transgressive here? Well, entomology. Flies are not feminine, not like botany or butterflies that ladies had customarily been tolerated to study. In the context of girls' education reform that the Allen family promoted, this was staking a claim that girls' study of flies was valid. 
In another example, sardonically titled Gems from a German Grammar Book, Alan exercises a non sequitur. Has your cousin any relations or friends? No, but she has a China ink stand. Such sophisticated humor was hardly expected of girl readers, who in print culture were usually characterized as frivolous heartbreakers, or if intellectual, doomed to be old maids. Cute or clever, all of Allen's humor is positioned between the polite but withering wit permissible to upper class ladies of previous generations and the vulgar, oft times savage or sexual humor of the working classes, best exemplified in the tradition of the mocking vinegar valentine, an early form of cancel culture practiced by women. Alan made references to both forms in her own work, contrasting them to her own genial funniness that was designed to bring girls together rather than drive classes apart, as withering wit or savage vulgarity did. Next slide, please. Alan's play, The Little Female Academy, was performed by her family schoolgirls. The modern girl, Tom Tompkins, with the hockey stick, uh, time travels to the 1850s and meets her own grandmother as a schoolgirl. Uh, the grandmother is the one with the purple hat in the middle. The villain, Priscilla Plume, here in green, embodying the vanity and vacuousness of the early Victorian feminine ideal, ominously warns Tom that she will be punished for her uncouth appearance. Tom criticizes the limits of glamour, luxury, and social prestige, and prefers physical and intellectual freedom, again, upholding the Allen's, Allen family's progressive values. Yet, the play also spectacularizes the very things it derides. The frocks are described in elaborate detail and the dress up is plainly fun. Pointedly, Tom admires her grandmother as an exemplar of kindness and natural prettiness that Priscilla lacks. Thus, Alan negotiates for having both old and new, reassuring girls that they could relish traditional femininity and rough housing at the same time, a lesson Alan frequently upheld in her own work and I'll say also her own life. <clears throat> in another student for it, or in another story, for instance, a romance plot turns on a rather autobiographical protagonist who is initially being a cute, naughty tomboy, and then after a scene in costume change, as a lace-wearing, marriageable prospect. But breaking with girls' fiction norms, she tells her suitor that she will give him an answer after she goes to art school, leaving the reader to imagine whatever ending they preferred. Aesthetically, Alan's own and other girls' realm illustrations often show a lack of polish, imprecisely drawn. Note the lack of pictorial space, the awkward hockey stick placement, visible brush strokes, the garbled hand holding the parasol, the feet placed out of perspective. Remember, Alan had four years of very high-end art school training. Rather than being simply bad drawing, this was a conscious choice acceptable <clears throat> to the editor of Girls Realm as well. I term this informal art style graphic nonchalance. Like cuteness, nonchalance allowed the delivery of pointed messages couched in a visual language of unseriousness, fooling around, nothing to see here. Doubtless it contributed to the stigma of women being lesser talents, but by mobilizing strategies of funniness and collectivity in their outsider status, this irreverence also paved the way for the more brazen flappers, modern girls, and design professionals of the 1920s and beyond. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jaylene. Our next speaker is Teal Triggs, a professor of graphic design at the Royal College of Art and founder member of the Women's Design and Research in Unit, which seeks to raise awareness about women working in visual communication and design education. This evening, Teal's paper discusses Fleur Cowles, Fleur Cowles, sorry, editorship of Flair magazine. So I'll pass over to you, Teal. Great, thank you very much. And thanks, Claire and Alex, uh, for this seminar series. Uh, it's been fantastic over the last uh, month or so that you've been running this. So um, I'm really enjoying this and I look forward to the uh, Q&A and the rest of the papers um, this evening. Um, a few, a few preliminaries before I begin. My talk is a mere introduction to a much larger book project situated in the fields of design history, publishing studies, and material cultural studies. The book seeks to offer a new narrative of the influential magazine Flair in the context of elite creative culture in the 1950s, uh, particularly in America. 
So to begin, if we can have slide one, please. This is a story about the visionary Fleur Fenton Coles and Flair magazine, which launched a new aesthetic paradigm for American mass produced lifestyle magazines in the 1950s. This is also a story about how inextricably linked the life of an editor and her publication can be to the extent of asking as historians, what is the lens through which we tell the narrative? Where does one story begin and another end? Fleur Fenton Coles was an American citizen turned British resident whose work as an editor, journalist, writer, surrealist artist, designer of interiors and ceramics, consultant to the Famine Emergency Committee during the Truman administration, appointed by President Eisenhower's ambassador to Queen Elizabeth's 1953 coronation, cultural patron and international socialite, played a significant role in promoting a lifestyle in the post-war period. She was a fashion icon and established an identity as captured in her obituary from 2009, dressed in large dark rimmed glasses, well-tailored suits, always adorned with a rose and a ring, one inch square of rough cut jade. I'm focusing less on dress for this talk rather than in, in, instead setting the stage for the emergence of a 1950s magazine representing an aspirational lifestyle. In Fleur Cole's first of two autobiographies published in 1975, and it is worth noting that she loathed the term autobiography and preferred to describe her storytelling approach as the telling of anecdotes. Fleur wrote, quote, mine is a typical American success story of a career during and just after the war. It was easy then, and it is still now, for a common life full of good luck as a reporter, editor, magazine creator, author, and unofficial diplomat, that American anomaly. In 1959, I added painting to my activities. Born Florence Friedman or Fanny on the 20th of Feb uh, January, 1908 in the Bronx, New York, she passed away on the 5th of June, 2009 at the astounding age of 101. Her father was Morris Friedman, a novelty salesman, and her mother's name was Lena Perlman. Two, consent, two census reports dating from 1915 and 1920 showed the entire family living in Bloomfield, New Jersey, not far from Montclair. These census list Fleur as Florence. As with many things involving Fleur, contradictions abound in the documentation of her life story. An entry in current biography from 1952 describes a different beginning. It reads, Fleur Fenton Coles was born on January 20th, 1910 not 1908, in Montclair, New Jersey, not the Bronx, where her father, Matthew Fenton, not Friedman, was a business manufacturer, not a novelty salesman. Her mother's name was Eleanor, not Lena. This encyclopedia entry gives some insights into Fleur's character. The entry subtracts two years from Fleur's age, adds changes to familial names, and elevates her father's career from novelty salesman to business manufacturer, suggesting Fleur's much sought after social status. Her early years are sketchy. In the interest of timekeeping, I will say that her formative training in arts practice as the owner of an advertising agency, a columnist for World Telegram in New York in the 1930s, led her to establishing herself as an editor. By 1946, according to the entry in the Truman administration archive, Fleur Fenton was already being introduced abroad as, the, as America's million dollar girl. That same year, Fleur Coles married her third husband, Gardner Coles Jr., who was heir to the highly successful Cowles Media Company, which held a portfolio of Midwest American newspapers and broadcasting outlets. Flair was a gift from her husband, though as Fleur writes, most wives choose yachts, horses, jewels, which I never wanted. I preferred the costly luxury of creating a magazine. Now it must be emphasized that Gardner Coles acknowledged his wife's editorial competency and was unlikely to invest over a million dollars in flair at a whim. She was an accomplished associate editor at Look Magazine, the main competitor of life, where she had introduced a family orientation and a women's department in the magazine, introducing food, fashion, and family problems. Importantly, Fleur was able to represent a woman's point of view as the only woman on the company's executive editorial board. Her innovative approach to design and content appealed and was further evidenced by her introduction to the company's smaller capsule-sized weekly newsstand publication titled Quick, 
reportedly reaching a circulation of about 850,000 in 15 months. But it was in the design and commissioning of authors, photographers, illustrators for Flair, where Fleur excelled and used her training and drive to good effect. Even though Flair magazine had a short publishing history, which included a 1949 advertising issue that you see here and 12 issues running from 1950 to 51, its legacy spanned decades. Two follow-up book collections were published in 1953 and 1996, and citations from contemporary independent magazines give a nod to Flair and Fleur's design influence. Next slide, please. Flair magazine did not appear out of thin air. Fleur Coles was very aware of what was happening in graphic design and printing and went to great lengths to ensure she understood the new techniques and processes emerging in Europe in particular. In early 1949, photographs show that Fleur visited Milan. On the back of one photo, a typewritten text appears glued to the, backs, to the back of the photograph, Fleur Coles and Milan on discovery trip for Flair. This included Flair visiting printing plants and paper mills in Europe who were considered at the leading edge of their crafts. A probable printing facility most likely includes Alferi and Lacroix established in 1890, whose facility could manage color photolithography films for offset. They were known for their foray into experimental printing, collaborating with applied artists and graphic designers. This Milan trip included meeting Daria Granati, publisher of the influential, um, the influential Aria d'Italia in the summer of 1949. Photographs of Fleur and Daria handling type from a printer's typecase show an early relationship between these two formidable publishers, eventually leading to a license, licensing of Daria's publication for Fleur's development of an American version. Flair was born out of an American pragmatism and European design aesthetic. The magazine is studied as a designed object born out of an eclectic amalgam of an editorial content, such as political reportage and barbecue cooking, and a unique form of graphic expression, including die cuts, pop-ups, decorative illustrations, and experimental printing. This pre-publication issue from 1949, two examples you see here, was mocked up to a full 118 pages with 5,000 copies printed for distribution to advertisers. It was available on newsstands at 50 cents per copy. And there was also a subscription deal which um, subscribers could buy into the publication for one year um, for 12 issues at $5 and each additional year over two years at $9. A reported 265,000 copies were sold every month. Flair makes it clear that the pre-publication issue to advertisers that this copy of Flair is my own statement and that the plan is possible. In doing it, I believe Flair gives you the new magazine you too have wanted. For her freelance and staff writers, Flair establishes her position. We will not presume to tell a writer what he shall write about and his art must be revealed to us. She sought expert photographers, fiction, and new writing in a process to reveal as many viewpoints as possible. Whilst the vision was entirely the making of Fleur Coles, she saw an advantage of gathering a stable of creative talent to deliver both content and form. Arnold Gingrich, who was co-founder and editor of Esquire, became the magazine's general manager. He writes, Flair's various departures from the norms of existing magazines, both in makeup and in format, while motivated only to be a desire to further the expression of its fundamental fresh, freshness of editorial approach, offers fresh opportunities for the inventive spirit of its advertisers too. Ironically, it was mainly the lack of advertising revenue that led to the publication's early demise. American advertisers were clearly not ready for any untried business models, despite using mock-ups of advertising campaigns by noted designer Paul Rand, whose bold stylistic approach captured what it meant to be a modern consumer in the 1950s. Next slide, please. So also included in the publication uh, were preeminent artists such as Jean Cocteau, who wrote about letter uh, to Americans and it, uh, whilst he was on a plane to New York. And this was developed more fully as a booklet for issue one, um, which took, um, was published in February of uh, 1950, uh, changing its title to a letter to Americans and elaborating much more fully in a very substantial um, 
pages 86 to 101. So the 1949 publication gave an indicator to advertisers of what might be forthcoming in issues. And Fleur used this to full advantage in really developing and allowing artists the kind of full spectrum of pages and printing techniques and artistic freedom that she had promised. What you see uh, in these two images um, are drawings uh, by Charles Sevigny uh, looking at a series which continued throughout uh, the publication's history, looking at uh, drawing rooms or other rooms, interior design within the house, and also the work of French artist and fashion illustrator René Grau, who was hired to work exclusively for Flair, having produced covers for magazines uh, for M Marie Claire, Vogue, and Harper's Bazaar. And he brought that much sought after European credibility for the magazine's approach to fashion editorials. It's also worth noting that these um, are tipped in elements to the publication. The drawing room has a fold out uh, accordion fold, uh, which goes outside of the publication. And the image, the, the Rene Grau uh, drawing below, you can see a light yellow mesh, which is a fabric tipped in to the publication itself. Again, these were um, materials that were used throughout uh, the one year uh, series of publications. And I just want to kind of uh, bring to the end of this, you know, the, the graphic language that uh, Fleur used was very much uh, based on her own uh, vision and her own way of doing things. For example, if you remember a few slides ago, the cover of um, Flair magazine, the logo uh, and the word Flair, uh, as you can see here, is actually the same way that Fleur signs her letters and her editorials. So the handwriting of the editor is brought forward uh, as the uh, identity for the magazine. This was used on the cover, on stationery, as well as advertising collateral. And it's important to note that over the, the, the 12 issues plus this one, the logo would change over time. Different permutations of her handwriting signature were used. And it was also carried over to the magazine's editorial, which was printed in gold colored ink and uh, drawn on uh, thin tissue, um, blue tissue like paper. Um, so these kinds of techniques, again, were very important, as was the distinguishable die cut hole in the cover um, and the accordion fold, fold uh, uh, booklets, which I talked about before. All of this was parodied uh, by American popular press at the time. And the New Yorker uh, did a series of um, uh, cartoons which had, for example, uh, men sitting in hotel lobbies clandestinely peering through the magazine's hole in the cover, pretending to be reading the publication, but looking at passerbys uh, in the hotel lobby. As Fleur writes in her autobiography, the cartoons were good natured intention and was a great help in publicizing the new magazine. She also had her credits, uh, her, her critics, uh, Mort Weisinger, uh, who was editor of the comic Superman, wrote an extensive seven page profile of Fleur in the writer's yearbook and vacillated between praise and critique of the first issue of the magazine, asking, quote, is Fleur's flair a fluke, a flash in the pan or a flying success? The last few minutes, I would just like to raise a couple of questions which have come out of my research on Flair and Fleur Coles and ask what this may mean for a process of reestablishing this work within a history of graphic design. What can you bring as a historian to someone's life story who has written two autobiographies alongside countless pieces of journalism, over 11 books, concerning painting, roses, flowers, animals, and arranged flower arranging. She has an inevitable way of weaving a story through stylistic methods of news reportage, anecdotes, and design. A great deal of writing on Fleur is drawn from a small number of articles written in the 1950s, excluding extracts from her own books and articles. Does the material provide an evidence base revealing what is curated for us to see or is there additional means through which evidence may emerge? I've worked with archive materials such as letters and correspondence, photographs and publication drafts, drawings and so forth, along conducting, alongside conducting interviews and using visual and content analysis. We must ask questions about the audience and provide a critical questioning of implied readership, readerships 
using data which supports an understanding of the actual readership. And this raises questions around the readers, their gender, race, class, and so forth. We know that the implied readership in the case of Flair, because Fleur tells us in her writings, but what of the actual readership? For example, a paper fragment in the archive reveals the name of the soldier setting off for Vietnam. Fleur publishes this in her 1996 edition as an anonymous author, but no less poignantly uh, states his writing, quote, I don't believe in war. I have nothing in this world worth leaving to anyone but my 12 issues of your magazine, Flair. They are on their way to you, end quote. Returning to this theme of hidden histories, I propose that there's an alternative narrative to be written, a hidden history, which does, no, does nothing to diminish the career of Fleur Coles, but rather shows a deeper understanding of her motivations and achievements. Flair Magazine was and continues to be a catalyst for this process. Thank you. Thank you so much, Teal. Um, next up, we have Elizabeth Tregenza, a fashion historian and postdoctoral research fellow at the VA. And tonight, Elizabeth will be discussing another Olive, uh, the fashion designer Olive O'Neill, and her role in the London fashion trade as a designer, consultant, and businesswoman. So I will hand over to you now, Liz. Fantastic. Thank you. If I can go straight on to the first slide, that would be great. Fabulous. In 1959, the journalist Ernestine Carter profiled managing director and fashion designer Olive O'Neill as part of a series looking at key figures in the London fashion trade. This article, entitled A Designer and Her Handwriting, was one of a number written in the 1950s and 60s, which established O'Neill's significance for the wider fashion trade as, as a designer, consultant and businesswoman. This paper will consider who O'Neill was and also why her name is no longer widely known. What I will present today is a tiny taster really for my upcoming book, not just copying London Wholesale Couture 1930 to 1970, which will be published with Bloomsbury in 2023. I will be discussing O'Neill in this book alongside many other key figures in the trade. However, considering Wholesale Couture was a sector which concentrated entirely on women's dress, it is perhaps striking that O'Neill is actually the only female figure I consider in any great depth in the book. This speaks of the division of labour within the sector of the trade, and also that very few women, unless the wives of male company directors, held positions of power within the wholesale couture trade. So just to step back slightly, wholesale couture was the very pinnacle of the London ready-to-wear trade. Producers in this tra sector traded on an oxymoronic exclusivity, largely producing garments which were at least loosely based on Parisian and Italian couture designs, but made in Britain using ready-to-wear methods. Their prices were broadly affordable for the middle-class woman's pocket. Olive O'Neill spent most of her career with the company Rose and Blairman, and Rose and Blairman was one of the earliest established of all of the wholesale couture houses. Founded by Harold Rose and David Blairman in around about 1921, and I should note here that um, uh, both Rose and Blairman were of Jewish heritage, which is what you find across most of the wholesale couture trade. Um, but as far as I'm aware, uh, actually uh, O'Neill wasn't of Jewish heritage, which actually sort of sets her apart from a lot of the other key figures in the trade. So in 1921, when, um, when I believe that Rosen Blairman was established, uh, I've set this date because this is the first year that the company appeared within Kelly's post office London Commercial and Trades Directory. And in this year, they were described as manufacturer's agents operating from two Howard Place in London. As earlier advertising points to, the company initially began selling imported French goods before also manufacturing their own primarily knitted garments. Most of these garments, the early garments designed for Rose and Blairman, uh, were really for women who lived active lives. The garments were largely simple but stylish, designed with sports like golf and tennis in mind, which were really kind of popular middle class pursuits of the period. And I just want to say something of the images on screen. So the uh, the, the image on uh, on the left hand side, um, it this is a uh, Rose and Blairman 
uh, advertisement. But what this really illustrates is about their brand name. So most of their products are actually manufactured under this brand name Dorville, um, rather than under the Rosenblumen name, which was their which was their company name. Um, so if I can go on to the next slide, please. Um, I want to return really properly to Olive O'Neill. So Olive O'Neill was born Olive Levy Fryer in 1902 in St. Helens, Lancashire. In 1926, she married Gordon Leo Malloy O'Neill. Their marriage seemingly ended in the late 1930s. However, Olive retained the surname O'Neill for the rest of her life. O'Neill spent her childhood in Southport and was interested in designing clothes from an early age. An interview in the Sunday Times suggested that she was expelled from Southport School of Art because dis tutors disapproved of the colours she used together, like pink and orange. I then believe that O'Neill spent some time working in Manchester, and this could have probably been around the time of the 1921 census, but try as hard as I might, I cannot find her. Um, I can find her sister, her mother, her father, but not her, um, because this would offer, with the kind of age she was around 18, it would have offered really useful information about kind of the early part of her design career. Anyway, so um, O'Neill, along with her sister, Mabel Mary Fryer, became associated with Rose and Blairman in the early 1920s. In 1926, the sisters briefly severed their connections with Rose and Blairman, becoming directors of a firm called Messrs Martin Stewart of Morley House, uh, Regent Street, which was a sportswear and knitted goods house. However, this was a short-lived venture. And by February 1928, O'Neill had rejoined Rosen Blairman as their showroom manageress. And this kind of point in the late 1920s is really kind of pivotal for this development of Rosen Blairman as a company and also O'Neill cementing her role within the firm. So 1928 was a time of much change for the company of Rosen Blairman with a move to new larger striking premises, Dorville House on Margaret Street, which actually um, the building that you can see in the advertisement still stands today. Um, and there is a little plaque outside that says Dorville House. Um, uh, so it's right on the corner of uh, John Prince's Street. So it's basically uh, opposite um, the London College of Fashion building. Um, so it's unclear when precisely O'Neill's role in the company changed from showroom manageress as she was in, according to the ad advertisement seen here uh, and she became a designer for the company but I think this probably happened in the early 1930s. There's kind of quite a distinctive change from about 1931 onwards in terms of the products that, that Dorval are offering and they go to really quite high fashion content and I, I assume this is because of O'Neill's input into the company. It should be said that O'Neill really ascended through the company ranks and, and by December 1934, she'd actually become a joint director of the company alongside Harold Rose and David Blairman. Um, and it was actually quite difficult to track Olive, I must say, um, not least because obviously she got married and she changed her name. And I had to be really certain that I was looking at the same two women in these photos, even though they're not that far apart, you can really see the kind of glamorization of her uh, in quite, short, uh, quite a short space of time, I think, as her kind of role accelerated. Um, so taking on the role of a company director in 1934 was extremely unusual in the sector of the trade. There were really only a handful of companies with female directors across the fashion trade at this point, um, and most were at least related to the male company directors. Indeed, it was also unusual, unless there was a joint head designer managing director role, for a designer to ascend to such a position of power in a ready-to-wear house in the night in the 1930s. By the 1950s, this had really changed and I can, I've seen a lot of the kind of firm, the designers becoming managing directors too. But I think it says something about O'Neill's perhaps power as a designer um, and that she had had so many roles for the company that she was able to ascend to this position. Um, if I can move on to the next slide, please. Throughout the 1940s and 50s and in, right into the 1960s, O'Neill's elevated position in the trade is clear. O'Neill was seen as one of the key wholesale designers, and she acted as a guest lecturer, invited guest lecturer at a number of universities, including the Royal College of Art. She also worked in an advisory capacity for other companies. Uh, for example, she was an advisor for Horrocks's when they launched their fashion brand Horrocks's Fashions in 1946. And Horrocks's very quickly came to dominate the mid-range cotton market. And I think it can be argued that O'Neill played quite a big role in the early success of the company. 
O'Neill was also chosen to design the uniforms for the Festival of Britain in 1951, as seen here. Um, for these uniforms, she was paid a fee of 50 guineas. Now, having looked through the archival records, I can't find any sort of definite reason as to why O'Neill was chosen over other designers, but I think she already held, she held quite a prominent position in the trade, and this is likely why she was chosen. These suits ensured widespread publicity for Rosen Blem and O'Neill and her design skills. And I think it's really suggestive probably of this position that she was asked to design them. O'Neill was also really widely respected by other fashion professionals. Journalist Ernestine Carter suggested that when she was starting her career as a fashion journalist, she asked her editor where to begin in terms of learning about the fashion industry. Her editor suggested that she went to O'Neill as she would tell her everything she needed to know thanks to her long and varied career in the industry. O'Neill's role post-1934 was always a dual one. So from this point onwards, she was always in this position of um, being both a managing director and she still occupied the role of head designer as well. Um, if I can just go back to the first slide, sorry. So O'Neill was always very serious about her role. Um, and the image that you can see of her on the right-hand side um, appeared in, in, in Tatler. And it's really striking that the kind of the article that this appears in um, that was talking really about women and business. Um, and here, O'Neill's workspace was decorated extremely differently to all of the other women's workspaces that appeared within the article. It was far more somber. Um, it was not feminine in any way. It was not fussy. There were no kind of trappings of femininity within her space. And arguably, you could even say it was more a more masculine space. And I think really this is all this idea of, of really of her wanting to be taken seriously and not seen necessarily as a woman, I suppose, in, in a way, as that as being sort of her defining characteristic. Um, if I can just go back to the, the my third slide, sorry. So it's extremely hard to find out about designers in the wholesale couture trade. Few head designers' names were publicised, despite how successful firms were. And there are a multitude of reasons for this, connected to brand image and the fact that most wholesale couture houses operated under a name, and that name was often the name of the company director. Publicly naming their head designer would kind of take away, perhaps, from this idea of the identity of the company. O'Neill was really an exception to this rule uh, because her name was widely publicised in, in kind of both the trade and, and more general, general public press. But why? And I think, I think this really mostly comes down to the idea of O'Neill's design aesthetic, which was quite identifiable. O'Neill was a skilled designer and her design and adaptation skills were highly regarded. She was quick in 1947 to adapt Dior's Corolle line for the British public replicating the distinctive hourglass silhouette in a range of suits and woolen dresses. A June 1947 article suggested, quote, whereas Parisian designers are insisting on special six inch deep corsets so tightly boned that wearers can hardly breathe, Mrs. O'Neill says English women wouldn't stand the tyranny and has achieved the same effect by building up the hips of her jackets and skirts with canvas padding. The article went on to indicate that the full skirt that the full skirted styles of Dior's new look had been replicated with stiffened canvas petticoats. This illustrates that whilst O'Neill copied the Dior line, she carefully considered what British women will be prepared to wear in her translation process. Unquestionably, O'Neill's aesthetic was one inspired by Parisian couture. She was described as, quote, an avowed disciple of Balenciaga and Givenchy. However, as Ernestine Carter goes on to suggest, O'Neill had, quote, evolved her own expression. Her paired away, simple, casual clothes announced their origin as clearly as if they were signed on the outside instead of being labelled within. Indeed, O'Neill's design aesthetic was one that was built on simplicity. She described her clothes, her, her garments, sorry, as background clothes designed to show off very handsome jewels. By the 1950s, O'Neill was designing her dresses with bodices, which were two sizes too big, to make her clothes appear easy rather than overly tight, what she referred to as sausage skins. And you can really see this in the dress from 1953 seen here. I, I think Olive O'Neill would hate my own preference for, for very tight clothes. Um, O'Neill wanted her clothes to be easy to wear and move in, designed for women who were lived active lives. In fact, really often her clothes were also designed for working women like herself she really was her own best model 
O'Neill really continued with this aesthetic throughout right through to what I think was her, the end of her career in the 1960s. But it's interesting that Rosen Blairman in the 1920s was founded on these principles of clothes for act, women living active lives. And this is really what O'Neill continued through with until the end of her career. So I have illustrated the important role that O'Neill played in the industry, but why is her name no longer known? And is there anything within this to do with the fact that she was a woman? Wholesale couture as a sector really disappeared in the 1960s when the desire for fairly expensive British made ready to wear, particularly suits, increasingly dried up. O'Neill's own career neatly fitted within the trajectory of wholesale couture. She became a designer as the sector was in ascendance and I believe retired in the mid 1960s. O'Neill's fade into obscurity is partly because of her gender, but more so I think because the company she worked for did not carry her name. Here I've only showed a tiny selection of designs and no actual garments, although I have been lucky to handle many. O'Neill was a skilled designer who led from a directorial, directorial and design perspective, one of the leading wholesale couture houses and is deserving of much more further study. Thank you. Thanks so much for sharing your research with us, Liz. Um, we've got one more speaker tonight, um, Madeline Pulsella, who is an interdisciplinary historian and artist based in New York. And uh, she's currently studying for a master's degree in decorative arts, design, history, and material culture at the Bar Graduate Center. And tonight she'll be analyzing Alice Vanderbilt's electric light dress. So I'll pass over to you, Madeline. Thank you. Thanks so much, Alex and Claire and everyone else who presented. You're all hard acts to follow. Um, we can go to the first slide. So I'm gonna be discussing the spirit of electricity or the electric light dress, um, which is currently in the collection of the Museum of the City of New York. The dress was designed by the House of Worth for Alice Vanderbilt, who wore it to her sister-in-law, Alva Vanderbilt's legendary fancy dress ball in the spring of 1883. The costume initially drew my attention because it stood out amongst the other dresses at the ball whose themes tended towards the historical, ethnic, or natural. By contrast, Vanderbilt's costume referenced a recent technological innovation. Thomas Edison had made the first public demonstration of his incandescent light bulb to a crowd of 3,000 people only a few years earlier, on New Year's Eve of 1879. In the photograph on the right, Jose Maria Mora captures Vanderbilt at the ball in costume holding an electric torch aloft. This too caught my attention because the Statue of Liberty wasn't installed until 1886. And when I first looked at the picture, I had a natural understanding of why the Statue of Liberty would be used to, to um, illustrate electric light. But as I thought about it further, I wasn't sure what the origin of that connection was. I was interested in looking into it. Um, Guided by the work of dress historian Rebecca Mitchell, I began to view the electric light dress as an exercise in self-fashioning. Mitchell argues that fancy dress costumes allowed women to render elite cultural context in personal terms. As I learned to read the language of Vanderbilt's costume, a message became legible. Vanderbilt was aligning herself with the future, literally donning cultural associations with electric light, at the time a cutting edge technology, as well as a fashionable novelty and luxury commodity, and because of its association with the Statue of Liberty, a symbol of enlightenment ideals and modernity. Opulent costume was only one facet of the ball's larger function. In Theory of the Leisure, leisure Class, published in 1899, Thorsten Veblen states that the utility of balls and other costly entertainments was to create an exchange of wealth and manners that assert a patriarch's power amongst his peers. He could easily have been talking about the Vanderbilt ball when he wrote those words. The Vanderbilts, though unbelievably wealthy, had been excluded from the upper echelons of New York's Gilded Age social hierarchy because they were considered nouveau riche by older, more established families. The ball was designed to flip the balance of power via a display of wealth so ostentatious that nobody could deny their position. The party's estimated to have cost $250,000, which translates to roughly $6 million in today's currency. Um, Veblen also claims women's fashions as a site for the conspicuous display of wealth and manners. This is especially true of a dress like the one worn by Vanderbilt to the ball, which despite being made from expensive materials by a world-renowned couturier, was presumably only worn one time. The costume achieves its electrifying effect via resplendent design program featuring embroidery of gold and silver filament, beadwork done with clear and gold beads, 
Um, the designs radiate outwards and graphic lightning bolt and starburst motifs and tinsel is applied playfully on the shoulders and bustle. And there are also pearls uh, sewn all along the neckline and I think on the shoulders as well. Um, and all of this affects the illusion that sparks are flying off of the young heiress. Even within the context of the ball's showy display of wealth, Vanderbilt's dress stood out for its opulence as well as its extremely fashionable silhouette and for the modernity of her chosen theme, electric light. Uh, next slide, please. Yes. In contrast, Alice Vanderbilt's husband, Cornelius Vanderbilt II, attended the ball as the French monarch Louis XVI, as did Mr. Edward Luekmeyer, Mr. Harriman, Mr. G.F. Fearing, Mr. Edward Spencer, and at least a dozen others, which is to say it was a very popular costume choice that night. Unlike masquerade balls of the 18th century, which participated in the mode of the carnivalesque, subverting social roles for masqueraders to realize desires otherwise forbidden by the social structures and sexual norms of polite society, revelers at Victorian fancy dress balls took the opportunity to present idealized versions of their own personas, validating rather than subverting the social present. Historicizing costumes were popular because they created a link between the wearing and European aristocracy, asserting social power and position. The cartoon pictured here mocks the aspirational self-fashioning that took place at the Vanderbilt dre fancy dress ball. The caption reads, Mrs. Knickerbocker gives a fancy dress ball, following the practice of the English nobility, requests her guests to appear in the costumes worn by their ancestors 100 years ago. As you can see from the image, um, all of the guests appear in colonial dress that it's identifiably lower working class, as well as in ethnic costume that identifies them as the descendants of immigrants. Um, and all of these would have been a jab at the pretension that American revelers generally exhibited when they wore aristocratic dress to a fancy dress ball. When choosing a costume, many partygoers relied on manuals like Arden Holt's Fancy Dresses Described, which catalog costume ideas and detail their component parts. Most of the costumes Holt describes are ethnic, historicizing, evocative of classical mythology, or inspired by the natural world. For example, Holt's um, book lists three kinds of bee costume, a regular bee, a queen bee, and a busy bee. Well, only two costumes in the edition that I was able to look at share a kindred spirit with Vanderbilt's electric light dress, referencing recent technological innovations for feats of engineering, and those were the Suez Canal and the Telegraph. The relative rarity of suggestions that celebrated innovation show just how brazen Vanderbilt was when choosing a costume to represent her persona. Rather than linking herself to long established social structures, a value that perhaps carried more weight for the so-called old families, Vanderbilt reclaimed the derogatory designation of nouveau riche, flaunting her wealth in an elaborate costume that celebrated novelty. She thus linked herself and her family not with the established past, but with a bright future. Um, next slide, please. Thank you. In the late 19th century, both France and the US were swept up in a wave of electromania. Um, as electricity became more accessible, electric light was marketed in instructive manuals to, to housewives as part of the constellation of luxury goods that made up the aspirational middle class interior. This marketing successfully branded electricity as a desirable commodity, contributing to its appeal as a fashionable accessory. And there are other examples of um, clothing and accessories that used electricity, either light or to create motion um, that I can talk about in the q and I, I had to cut it for time, they're fun. Um, in addition to marketing electricity as a luxury good, early advertisements for electricity represented visually as electric light created an association between the new technology and enlightenment ideals regarding modernity, as well as Republican ideals regarding personal freedom and liberty. The graphic vernacular that emerged from these advertisements in both France and the US relied on neoclassical depictions of liberty. Um, and in the zeitgeist of 1870s and 1880s Paris and New York, a 151 foot tall copper colossus, Frederick Auguste Bartholdi's Statue of Liberty or Liberty Enlightening the World was a ready stand in for both electrical lighting and its concomitant associations with enlightenment and personal freedom. Though the statue wasn't unveiled until 1886, it was displayed in parts throughout the 1870s as part of a fundraising campaign for the completion of her pedestal. 
1876, Liberty's torch was displayed at the Centennial in Philadelphia, um, illuminated with electric light. And her torch bearing arm was installed in Madison Square Park the following year, which you can see in this central image. Bartoldi in turn had appropriated images of La Liberté, the personification of enlightenment ideals that drove the French Revolution. By the mid to late 19th century, this type of female figure thrusting forward, carrying a symbolic instrument, uh, in this case a torch, and draped in classical costume was a trope of academic art. This is the pose that Vanderbilt adopts in the Mora portrait. Uh, and her torch and the reference to classical drapery on her dress complete her transformation into um, the Liberty figure. Uh, in conclusion, Vanderbilt's electric dress rendered many facets of her surrounding culture in personal terms, allowing her to literally embody cultural shifts. By selecting the theme of electric light and the posture of the Statue of Liberty, Vanderbilt projected the message to her peers that she was fashionable, modern, and progressive. In light of the party's motive to install the Vanderbilts comfortably at the top of New York society, Alice Vanderbilt's electric light dress can be read as somewhat tongue-in-cheek. While members of more established families came in historical costume that confirmed their status by linking them to European aristocracy and history, Vanderbilt made herself a vision of progress, perhaps a reference to Edison's electric light company or a private joke about the designation of her wealth as too new. Either way, Vanderbilt's costume asserted that she and by extension her family were the future of New York society. Thank you.